Let's see if this works. Okay, I think we're live. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the weekly Strength Club uh, Q&A, form checks, um, and shitposting session. Uh, today's topic is going to be finding a good gym. It's going to be part of our New Year series. Um, it's going to be about you just started your starting strength LP. You got the fancy book. You got the fancy app. You're you're very excited and uh, and, and red in the ears, um, and you want to find a good gym. How do you go about doing the process? How do you vet a gym? What are you looking for? All that stuff. Um, I have Chase Lindley with me here. Chase, what's going on? It's happening. Um, just living the dream, man. Uh, everything is going well in OKC. We're slowly adding more people. It's kind of weird because we expected to kind of like a dead area about this time with like the holidays coming up, but mm-hmm. for some reason we get, we're getting people treacling in, so we're, oh, we're nice. doing good. I think it's people being nervous about seeing their relatives. <laughs> is what it is. I don't know. What it is. So, what, so what's they funny, don't want to like, be like fat and weak, weak around their mom. That's yeah, exactly. It's so. What we're, we're experiencing is like some people just finally walk in. They're like, yeah, I've seen this place for about three months. And I decided just to walk in. It's like, you've seen us for three months. Like, we always have open houses every Saturday. Like, why didn't you just come what in so and long? talk to us? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, All right. Eh, I don't know. Chase, you've talked enough. That was terribly uninteresting. Amanda, <laughs> how's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, so I'm originally from Chicago, which is where I'm currently at right now. Um, I was a college strength and conditioning coach for about six years and then made the jump over to starting strength gyms when uh, Denver opened in January of 2020, the best year of our lives. Um, so uh, got uh, got going over there. And uh, so now I'm actually back in Chicago for about a month transition, and then I'll be heading out to Beaverton, Oregon, uh, to head up the gym out there. That hopefully we're opening uh, right after Christmas. Have you been to Oregon before? Like, have you have uh, you lived there at any point in your life? No, no, never lived. I visited uh, now I'm probably about three times. So, <laughs> so it's uh, it, at least weekend trips just to kind of check out the area and everything. But if you had to rank places. Chicago, Oregon, and then Ooh. Denver. Where are you going? <laughs> um, I mean, God, they're all good for different reasons. I mean, obviously Chicago is home, so, but, okay. uh, you know, they all have their pros and cons. It but, sounds uh, like Oregon is in a far number three. <laughs> it's it's like a negative like, three for me. Like, she's like, oh, like, oh. <laughs> it's like Oregon has a great personality. But it's, yeah, where's, where's, where's yeah. the least like I'm going to get a brick thrown at me? Oh, yeah. yeah well, you know, in Chicago, Chicago, you got to duck your head every once in a while, too, so. Yeah. I guess I just stay, uh, I just stay on alert, but, um, I mean, I've picked obviously the most interesting places to live. I was also in Sacramento for a little while. So, um, so I've kind of picked, uh, you know, just stay on alert and do you, and we'll see what happens. You just wear a helmet around the street for casual yeah, walking. Yeah, I, People well, don't I, talk to you if you're out in public with a helmet on. Um, <laughs> That's a but, good point. I'll have yeah. to keep that in mind. Okay. Um, you wrote a, you wrote an excellent article that I read today, but the title is escaping me. What is the title of that article again? Uh, well, I wrote the the one that was uh, like why SS or SCCC, uh, like why not to do that? Yeah, uh, exercise physiology and why to be uh, an SSC. Um, this I wrote it before I was even a starting strength coach. Um, and in pursuit of mm-hmm. you know, working at the gym and and trying to make that transition. Um, it was the most acronym heavy article that I've ever read in my Very life. Very much so. <laughs> yeah. And I had to think about all the letters that I was writing out anyways. I'm like, okay, that's easy. Just like I was just talking. I, I did, There's so many letters. Um, yeah. But to be honest with you, it was just, uh, I lived both, I guess. It, you mm-hmm. know, I, I went through what I thought was the gold standard of, of strength and conditioning to, you know, work with 18 to 22 year old athletes and, um, you know, I'm not going to knock my time there completely. I enjoyed it, had some good athletes that I trained with, but once I learned, you know, and read the books, you know, mm-hmm. the, the blue book, it, it just was, why have I not been doing this for, for longer? Um, so then I started doing it in college and, and, um, I was a part of another article that, uh, Jared Neslin wrote, um, basically how we implemented the linear progression with college athletes and modifications and Hey, you got right. an hour do, you know, right. and you got an hour and you also have to do a conditioning test and, you know, we want to see box jumps and, and you and need a band- dynamic warm up, Yeah. And banded yeah. this and that. So, uh, um, so what college was this at again? So I did my graduate work at uh, Northern Illinois university. Um, I did two years there. And then once I graduated, I went out to, uh, Sacramento state, um, to work under Jared Neslin. So it's kind of, he was, um, 
him and his assistant, Tom Dostasio, mm -hmm. uh, were the only known college strength coaches that implemented the, you know, right. starting strength method or anything like that. Um, so when I was interviewing for the job, he basically said, Hey, here's these books, order them on Amazon and, and get to reading. So, um, and I had yeah, read yeah. the practical programming, like the second edition, Ooh, just out of context. It was just, yeah. It was just out of, it was like, Oh, this looks interesting. And it, I'm reading it and I'm like, damn, okay, this makes In sense. 2005. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, uh, so I, I, you know, once I got introduced to the books in, you know, in order, I guess you could say it was, it was like, okay, I, I see where we're going with this. And, um, so yeah, I was out at Sacramento state for two years. Then I went back to Northern Illinois as the Olympic mm -hmm. director. Um, and that's kind of where, you know, I started just, I had my own opinions and I had, you know, I had my own vision about how strength and conditioning should work and, uh, right. wasn't always the best to have your own opinions in a, in a college setting. So. <laughs> yeah, no opinions allowed. Um, so I'm familiar with SNC, so the the school that I interacted with, the University of Pittsburgh, and then the way that uh, they ended up doing it there was that for all of the undergraduate and graduate assistants who were working with the SNC department, they were essentially just like they went from team to team based off of mm -hmm. semester. Is that the way that you did it, or were you assigned to a, just you know one team? Let's just, let's just say track for the entire duration. Or were you going wrestling, track, football, basketball, volleyball, or what were you doing? Yeah, I was assigned teams uh, kind of right out of the gates. If, if I had to, you know, be honest about it, it was kind of the teams that, you know, nobody wanted. I, I don't want to say nobody wanted, but it was kind of, you know, the footballs and the baseballs and the softballs and the basketballs, right. those were all taken. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were all by established uh, strength and conditioning coaches. And, yeah. you know, so you come in and, you know, those teams were used to kind of that cycling in and out of, of strength coaches. So, and they were... I guess in a sense easy because maybe they're they considered their sports not heavy on the strength side so mm -hmm. they were like you know you can't really mess us up because we're not we're only going to be in there one or two times a week and when we are in there we're not going very right. heavy it was you know so i had um basically put myself in a situation where you know i'd work with the teams that i had and then i'd want to be on like another coach's kind of coattails and just you know Hey, what can I help you with? What can I do here? I want to eventually work with this team. So mm -hmm. kind of threw myself wherever I could just to see some different, uh, different athletes, but not okay. necessarily being able to implement things that I believed were. were right. Effective. Yeah. Yeah. Attendance and just like, just biting your tongue the entire <laughs> yeah. time. Like, yeah. But what yeah. if we did this instead? Um, yeah, it seems writing. like we finally, we have some more people in the, or at least I can see on the viewer count. Um, if you have any questions or anything, please post them up. Ideally, they're all for Amanda. So she could just not stop talking the entire time. <laughs> Nobody talk to Chase. That's the rules. For yeah, the this, entire... is, this is great. Like, I'm, I'm I know Chase, you're doing, shit. you're killing it this episode, man. I um, am. But uh, but yeah, this is good that we have you on for this episode. I think because Chase has had, and I'm 100% speaking for him, he's had very pure and very finely selected experiences as to what gyms he's been at and everything. He landed on like the right thing from the get go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whereas like from my experience in the world of physical culture, the first like five years was complete dicking around in tomfoolery, you know, um, of just doing like just the worst memes that you can possibly think of. It wasn't like BOSU ball stuff, but still it was bad. Um, so in terms of like having experience into the greater world of, uh, seeing what like silly PTs and silly coaches are doing, that'll be, mm -hmm. that'll be good for this one. Um, yeah, for sure. yeah. Crown of iron. Hi all dumbbell douchebag checking in. How's it going, Crown? Um, yeah, Crown is, last is he week. Calling himself that? Yeah, he was. He was the guy who was like, "I need to find some way to superset in my arm work. Is oh, it okay if yeah, I take?" That's right. that's he right. wanted to take some dumbbells to the squat rack, and I was like, "Do it, man! I'm not going to get yelled at, so it's fine." <laughs> oh God, this is a good one. This is a good one. I can't put it on the screen though. I'm sorry, <laughs> Amanda. Can you see the chat on the I side? I sure can. Oh <laughs> man! All right, how do I? Here we go. Boop. We have to block this user. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, fuck that dude. Uh, but yeah, this, like I have, I have like. It no finally experience. happened, by the way. Normally, that does not happen. This is one of our first and most notable. I think. Normally, it is all completely very kind. Pal posting from Jeff Riggins. He always just says hi, pals, in every stream. Um, but all right, we'll get into the meat of it. So we just stop, we stop dicking around here. Um, so what we're going to put Amanda's contact information here too. I'll put it in the description below. Um, but these are just ours for now. Uh, Instagram, Chase, what's going on your Insta? Nothing. Just, it's basically a lot. <laughs> no, nothing. Um, 
<laughs> I mean, I had I hardly ever post. Um, not as frequent as like once was, but if I find something that's worthy, I feel like because I'm always yeah. like, ah, you know, this will shit today. I'll I'll post it. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, uh, do you, do you post people's lifts from your gym? And okay, see, no, that's, you're like that's only our our main page on the Starting Strength Oklahoma City page. Mm, okay, mm-hmm. um, and you have your backup account there, uh, and then you can find me at my website um, for online coaching and uh, consults. Um, I do in person work for locally for the Virginia Beach area, and I do a lot of training camps too, um, particularly between uh, Pittsburgh. I guess with my hands here. Here's the camera: Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, Boston, and then out in California, Vegas area, Southern California. Um, those are the three places I usually hit up. Um, but outside of that, you know, we're there. Uh, we do need some more videos. We're, we're getting towards the bottom of our queue for form checks and everything like that. But if you have some videos that you want us to go over, um, email them to support at strength.club. You can submit them through the Starting Strength app as well. Um, do and boop. Our topics, introducing Amanda, exclamation point. Do you feel like we've done that sufficiently, Amanda? I would say, I think, I think so. You got about uh, all my life right there in that, in that wrap up. Are we sure? <laughs> I mean, ask away. You didn't want to dig a little bit. Yeah. Okay. okay so this is like an onion. All right. We're going to peel it back layer by layer. Oh, I am mm. an onion. I am an onion. That is <laughs> that's for sure. That's the ideal starting strength physique is Shrek. I think. <laughs> oh. yeah that's the the ideal torso for lifting um but uh but yeah okay um how long did you work at the first starting strength gym that you were at i'm assuming this was the jared right uh yeah yeah i was under okay. uh worked with jared um did the night classes um so i was there from when we opened january 2020 until um october the, this the was denver october. yeah okay are you gonna miss yeah. it do you think yeah, yeah. I mean, I I worked with some some pretty awesome clients out there. I mean, they. Uh, they I won't tell it, anybody. No. Ton. Say again. If you say no, I won't tell anybody. <laughs> no, that's all right. They know. They're probably I mean, not watching this, anyways. No. no, by no means. By no means. But uh, no, I mean, it was it was great. I learned a ton. So uh, I mean, it definitely gonna miss it out there. Beautiful weather. You can't can't doubt that. I'm going somewhere where. I think it rains like 364 days out of the year. So I'm really excited about that. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a lot of sleek fashion options in the rain jacket department. But yeah, right, Colorado's, right, right. Colorado's gorgeous. Um, yeah. I've been to uh, Colorado Springs a few times and that's, that's really lovely. Um, we have two questions in the chat. We'll do those and we'll get into the topics. Um, doop doop. Uh, G-Lock, tips for hotel fitness centers. I'm in a hotel right now with dumbbells up to 50 LBS. What do you guys think? I think we're going to attack this as we go, but um, you want to get exercises that look as close to possible as exercises that we're doing in starting strength, right? Um, so if you have dumbbells up to 50, that's doing maybe some RDLs with those 50-pound dumbbells, uh, a dumbbell bench, um, and then maybe a goblet squat, something that's kind of attacking, uh, like I said, all the lifts that we we specialize in. I like using the word attacking. I've never heard you say that before ever, Chase. I'm pretty sure I have. You're attacking things now. That's cool, Amanda. Yeah. What do you think? It's a, it's that OKC vibe he's got going. Yeah, on. exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I can agree with that. It's uh, you're kind of um, confined to what you what you have there, and that that is it. You know, mostly fitness centers up at hotels up to fifty. That's you know you're the weight that you're gonna get. So try to do everything you can as close to the model. Um, you know, it's. I don't know. I'd like to tell this person that if they could to research ahead of time and, and see if they could find a, a gym, a gym yeah. closer. And, you know, it, it, but at the, at the same time, they're like, ah, oh, this is what I got. And so I think Chase nailed it. You're going to do everything as close to you, what you can. Um, but you're definitely limited by weight. So, you know, hopefully you can get through your hotel stay and uh, get back in the under a barbell. Yeah. Treat it as a deload if you need a deload at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, revert to if we're you know following our four criteria um for muscle mass uh range of motion all that stuff um weighted chin up weighted pull up uh weighted dip weighted push up they're excellent um most people cannot do you know a set of 15 paused weighted push-ups with 50 pounds if you can sick 
make it to 20, you know? Um, sure. But it's just like, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do to still fit your slots. Um, the things that you're going to have a hard time fitting are going to be the deadlift pattern and then uh, the overhead pattern. Cause it's just like, you're not going to be able to maybe I'll kind of balance more than 50 pounds in there. You can sit a tiny dumbbell on top of the 50, but it's not really going to work. Um, mm-hmm. So handstand pushups, if you're cool and athletic, uh, the deadlift patterns are really hard. I'll always tell people to do some sort of pre fatigue if possible. So like what Chase was saying, so it's like, you can do goblet squats. You can even just hold both of the fifties for your goblet squats, do a high rep set. And then as soon as you're done with that, the second you are drop into an RDL, you know, your glutes are going to be a little more fatigued. So, um, you got to use a lot of intensity techniques when you're dealing with very light weights. Um, mm-hmm. this is why we like heavy weights. Cause it's a lot simpler. Um, and the next question from cool dude, uh, is there a specific starting strength approach to muscular and skeletal imbalances? What do you guys think? Yeah. I mean, Rip kind of made it clear in his book and it's, we're loading the body doing normal human movements and we're gradually loading it five pounds at a time. So let's say if you have an imbalance that's where if it's not severe, but you notice that like you have a leg showing the other, you had some dumbass physiotherapist say, Hey, look, your glutes not firing as optimal as your left one. I think you need to do something with like single band, you know, adduction. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Like you just need to get your squat heavier and stuff like that. But if it's something um, like that's a major event that happened in your life, like a car crash or something like that, to where you have lost 50% of your quad, that's going to be a little bit of an issue, right? And we can kind of work around that as best we can with modifying the weights, uh, the range of motion, all the stuff that we talked about in kind of past episodes and skeletal imbalances, um, kind of the same thing. Like if you have a leg length discrepancy, we shim one leg. If you have an arm length discrepancy, I haven't seen one of those yet, but I oh, those are fun. You can you can mess around Oof. with the grid, I, I assume. Yeah, mm-hmm. I had I had a just to kind of go off of that. I had a guy with a short, humorous um, uh, watching him bench was I was like, what is going on? I'm like kind of looking from all angles and and finally figured it out and um, you know asking around, has anybody ever seen this? I mean, to this degree that it looked like the I mean the weights were gonna fall off. The, the bar on one side when he was benching. I mean, it was insane. So, um, so we had a little bit of adjustment in his, in his level of his bar, as far as, um, he had to pitch one side a little bit, um, to get his, uh, elbows in the, in a similar, as close to similar spot as we could, um, on the bench press. And that was interesting. So, yeah, I mean, obviously having a coach to, to find some of those things out for you is helpful, but, um, you know, for the muscular, I could kind of speak on that personally. Um, I had uh, surgery in March um, and probably lost just out of my own curiosity. I lost probably close to two and a half inches, three inches around my uh, um, around my right uh, quad. And you know, when I was once I got cleared to to take full full load bearing, I started with just some bodyweight squats, and then one bar, the next bar and five pounds at a time, 10 pounds, if I could tolerate it. And, uh, and now my, I mean, I'm back to, uh, the, the same musculature as far as muscle mass around the quad area that, you know, and I didn't use single leg this or that, and, um, you know, banded, you, you know, four leg hip or four way hip or anything like that. I was, I was, uh, just loading as intensely as I could a linear progression, uh, something that I could tolerate. And, and that was in the span of, you know, and I'm, hoping to write an article just to kind of cover that a little bit more in depth, but just the idea that these muscle imbalances are, are something that are, uh, is particular to you. Yes. Yours is your, your own data point, but at the same time, um, you know, everybody's going to kind of want, they want to be symmetrical. So mm-hmm. your body's going to catch up. Um, and it, it's going to do it by, if you, if you load it correctly and intensely enough, um, you know, that's kind of my, my perspective on it. And now her quads are 28 inches, by the way, <laughs> mm-hmm. soon to be 30. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, Olympia 23. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so w- whenever we're thinking about, you know, let's just say an imbalance in the quad, the quads are a really good example. It's super simple in relationship to the squad. Um, you, let's say we have one that is dramatically weaker than the other one. Um, what you're going to be doing by applying a bilateral stimulus and you're not being a weenie about it. So let's say like if Amanda, she had her right quad, just had surgery just reattach something in there. And she was entirely leaning on her left leg. The left leg would still be getting a good amount of stimulus. But if she's doing the movement, what we would call correctly or efficiently, the weight distribution is even on both legs. 
the rate limiter for everything is going to be the weak leg. So the weak leg is getting as, as much stimulus as it can, right? And then the strong leg is getting proportionally less stimulus. So you can consider that in a light maintenance phase for the strong leg, and then the weak leg will catch up over time. Um, so if you're doing these bilateral movements correctly, um, they will you know, fix a muscular imbalance just by the fact that the weaker side will have disproportionately higher stimulus than the stronger side. Um, for skeletal imbalances, the only thing I think you can do is get like that crazy Chinese plastic surgery where they break your shins. And you like lay in a hotel room screaming for three months to be like two inches taller. Um, I think that's it for skeletal imbalances, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, Rip has some guard. Art- Are there any other articles on it outside of Rip has that one finding leg length discrepancy articles? Are there any, any other ones? Um, I'm sure there is. I mean, I think maybe Sullivan maybe wrote something about it mm-hmm. or one of the doctors like Patrizio or something. But um, yeah, I mean, when, when it's structural stuff like that, like, like what you were saying, we can't really add on to more structural stuff. We can mm-hmm. make it more dense and stronger, but we can't increase the size. We can't decrease the size unless we're doing invasive surgery. Yeah, we're going to start a GoFundMe for Chase so he can be 6'3". He just has oh, yeah. to stop lifting for three months while, no. <laughs> while we break his shins repeatedly. No. Um, <laughs> but all right, we'll, we'll get through the rest of these guys. Um, Crown of Irony says, my deadlift as of Monday is a 167.5 for a set of five. Um, next week, if I hit 170, getting close to the NLP end times. Yeah, Crown, I feel like you've been on the LP forever, especially because uh, Australia just keeps taking away your ability to go outside. So mm-hmm. that's probably going to happen again. And there you go. You have another LP. <laughs> no. All right. Another question. Those uh, are what always per- fun. <laughs> yeah. Forced uh, quarantine layoffs. Um, what percentage should halting deadlifts be of your one RM? And I hear you say that one set of eight is sufficient or good. What do you guys think? Yeah. Um, I think you really shouldn't worry about a percentage. Just worry about how you can set your back effectively and do the motion uh, properly without worrying about the weight. So, for example, um, if my one RM is 600, I'm not going to go down to 80% to where it's, you know, somewhere in the low fives or even the high fours. I'm just going to go up to a weight to where I can keep my back in extension and I can focus on hanging on to that extension as I'm performing. The movement. Um, eights again, they're perfect. Cause that's just how they are. I don't know who came up with eights, but RDLs or I'm sorry, not RDLs, but haltings. They have a shorter range of motion. It's just working off the floor. And someone figured out a long time ago that eight is better than fives. That should be your next article, Chase. Why eights? It's Why just eights? very short. It just says just because. <laughs> just because somebody said. said. <laughs> yeah. It would get a lot of views, I think. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that. I think when I've I've programmed halting deadlifts or even rack pulls when you're trying to figure that out for somebody um, in the gym specifically, Um, you know, I might use a percentage for, you know, kind of a roundabout number at first, um, but allow them a little bit of, uh, kind of a range on either side. Like Chase said, you got to be able to do the movement correctly and set your back and, um, have it perform the purpose of the, of the halting deadlift. So, um, if you're deciding that this is something that's a a limiting factor and you want to use this movement pattern, um, you know, give yourself a little bit of a. Uh, leeway either way to to make sure that it's going to be a good movement and uh, that you can progress it uh you know successfully for whatever program you're on right now or of whatever like the time um you know like it's like chase said you know we're not like percentage this is the most important it's can you do the movement correctly and you're having it fulfill the purpose you're using it for yeah it's like uh, i think the people who are overly I mean, it's kind of the same, same thing with R, with rpe but the people who are like overly anal about or being a weenie about percentages it's just it's entirely unproductive for most people um just to be like hey you know we're going to introduce haltings to this cycle and you know i need you to ballpark this at 77.5 percent of your deadlift and you're like <laughs> but my if i go in and do a single on a deadlift it varies 40 pounds anytime i do it you know what yeah. I mean? So it's just like, what, what, what exactly, what data are we basing this off of? Um, this is where some of the qualitative stuff comes into play, um, especially with being a more mature lifter. Like if I have someone who's been lifting for two months, decide to do a halting, 
they will not be able to tell when it's hard enough for them to be useful where it's like chase mm-hmm. is a seasoned athlete. So when he's sending his back and he's like, and you know, let's say he works up to three fifteen or something for his haltings for, you know, say eight or 12 or something like that. Um, and he's doing it and he's like, this feels productive. I can tell this is heavy enough to where I'm going to get something out of this. Um, if you're a novice who's deadlifting 185 and then you're like, I'm doing a halting with 115. I don't know if it's helping. It's kind of, it's, it's not super helpful. Um, so that's where having like maturity around barbells is really helpful. Cause you'll be able to tell when accessory work is actually helping you. Um, I say this, I pass along this rip quote. We have a rip quote on the screen that you're thinking too hard about this one. Excellent quote. Um, but, uh, I think it rip at one point said, get your deadlift to 500 and then you can have opinions about things. It's incredibly true, you know, mm-hmm. cause you know, if you're, if you're like, my deadlift is stuck at 315, but I really like RDLs and is an accessory. It's like, no one cares. Yeah. <laughs> you cool, know, man. yeah, it's cool like story. sick. You know, I'm really glad your, your uh, RDLs are helping you hover between 315 and 335. <laughs> um, but I yeah. think that's, I mean, that's a, I, that's actually a great point. Cause I, you've had people, I've had people say all the time, like, you know, how do I get my deadlift to, you know, whatever arbitrary number they want to reach or what do I do? What movements do I have to do? Oh, you have to deadlift, you know, you have to, you mm-hmm. have to do what you want to get better at and it has to be heavy. And, you know, so when you see that, they're looking for something. I think in, in reality, they're trying to, they're looking for the easy, give me the easy way so that I can get to a 405 deadlift. And right now I'm at 315. What's the one secret trick I can do? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have another question, or maybe this is the first second uh, from cool dude. Um, he says, I have some nerve issues because some places of my spine are getting stuck and my hips are overly tight. Um, she also said that my traps and upper back are much more developed than my lats and lower back. All this right, is so a there's... this is a train wreck of a post, cool dude. Yeah, it is. So let's kind of break this down. So cool dude, like, what do you mean by getting stuck? Like, you're experiencing paralysis? Or like, I mean, if you're stuck, then that's some serious shit, right? If it's tight, that's just flexibility. Like, that's just God gave you that shit, right? Don't worry about that. You don't really need too much flexibility in your back, right? We want it to be stable and tight. Um, and then the the definition of the traps in upper back, of course, you're going to see more, right? So think of like the muscle bellies and all that shit of the anatomy of the upper back versus your low back. Like you don't see my spinal erectors. Like they're not bulging out. They're, they don't have like, they're not serrated. They don't have. That's because you have tiny erectors, Chase. That's probably what it is. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, it, but you don't really see much definition in the back like that, right? You see just how broad it is and how big it is. Um, but you see definition of like the traps of like the, um, of the posterior delt and all that stuff more so than you can like the low back stuff. Yeah, I, like most people are too fat and not muscled enough to have yeah. like someone's palpation of saying muscular development really mean anything at all. You know, um, it's like you'll you'll run into some PTs or some chiropractors who are like, oh, you know, I can feel from massaging your back that your rhomboids are underdeveloped, mm-hmm. and it's like the rhomboids are a relatively deep muscle that are like three millimeters thick. You know, if you are jacked as hell, they're still not that big. You know, like mm-hmm. it, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, so like I think the stuck thing. I think he may just be referring to not being able to extend or flex his back very much. You know, like we, we, we've all run into older people who are just kind of like their torsos look like a meatball and they can't move their spine at all. They're just kind of stuck in the same position. Could be talking about that. Um, you know, the, one of the best stretches that you can do is a deep squat. And if you're not getting as deep as you want to now, keep squatting. You'll get better at it over time. You'll adapt to it just like the rest. Um, but I think uh, I don't think you're really having any nerve issues. You would you would see symptoms of radiculopathy. That would really be the only common nerve thing, you know, outside of some random fringe case. Um, Jonathan Sullivan has a good YouTube series on that. I think it's called the C7 Chronicles. Go check that out. Um, Gray Steel Strength. Um, but yeah, send in some videos, cool dude. You could just be squatting poorly. Who knows? Um, all right, we're 28 minutes into this, guys. We're, we got to get through this shit. I don't know who to blame. It's probably me. Um, all right, so defining a good gym, how to find a good gym, and then form checks. Um, all right, we're going to do it like, let's do it like this. Here we go. Okay, um, so considerations for a good gym. I broke them down into four. Um in a rough priority order, uh, the first one is going to be like logistics. Like if it is even feasible, a gym that's two hours away from you is not a gym that's five minutes away. That's pretty nice. Um, the price, if it's like Equinox in New York and it's, you know, $400 a month, um, just to get in the door, or if it's, you know, a planet fitness and it's $10, it's within your budget, um, things like that. And then the hours, you know, if you work night shift, you're going to be able to go to any gym during the day. That's great. Um, if you work until eight o'clock at night, but the gym shuts at nine, 
you know, that's not really great. Um, the next thing being equipment, this is the, this is the one to talk about. Um, for someone who's starting the SS NLP, what equipment are we looking for guys? Um, you know, what recommendations do we have for people in the selection process for a gym? Definitely a good bar. Definitely, um, some, a place to where your rack isn't fixated in height. Like I know there's some places to where like, uh, those squat rack looks like kind of like this, like slanted angle. And there's just basically tacked on bolts to where oh, the stair can, rack. Yeah. Yeah. The stair rack. Terrible. Um, yeah. so that's, yeah, that's fucking terrible. Um, so you want, again, that type of rack, uh, to where it's adjustable and you're able to squat safely in it. Um, and it's, it's not too crowded. You have enough room to kind of walk around and, so you nothing. said good bar. How does someone who's never touched a barbell figure out what that is? Um, so <laughs> is it of, straight? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a big one. Uh, Priority nailing, number one. Right, yeah. So there, is there knurling on the bar? If it's just a, a pipe, right? It's all nice and smooth. That's not a it's not a bar. Um, the thickness too. Make sure that you have not a twenty seven millimeter. If you aren't for that bar, right? So if you need a normal standard bar, like twenty nine to 28.5 is fine. Um, and if you're doing like the Olympic lifts, make sure you have a bar that spins very well. There's there's a bunch of factors that go into bars and stuff. Um, but I think Amanda kind of hit the big nail on the head here and just make sure it's straight. <laughs> make sure it's, it's usable. Mm-hmm. They have a, there's a, I hate, I see these damn things every episode. There's a video on the starting drink YouTube about this, right? How to tell if a bar is straight. Yeah, I think so. I went over this. Yeah, okay unsurprisingly there's already a video on it go check that out um but yeah figure out if the bar straight this is one thing it's like you'll go into you know let's like a, a lot of 24 hour fitnesses um anytime fitness whatever the hell they're called and you'll go in and they'll have they'll be like oh wow look at that like you know 1500 dollars leg curl machine but mm-hmm. they'll have like a hundred dollar barbell that's just a piece of crap um you know so like going in and if you just ask the gym employee be like hey what barbells do you have here and if they're like hey we have a texas power bar we have an ohio power bar um we have a few deadlift bars and then we have like a 29 or a 30 millimeter squat bar you're set mm-hmm. You're all set. If the gym employee knows what barbells they have, that means they actually care about the barbells. Mm-hmm. Um, if they go in and they're like, they're pretty straight, I think they're 45 pounds, probably not the best place <laughs> go to go. Go somewhere else, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, and then one other thing to mention is that you want to have one with a center knurling. So knurling being the sharp part of the bar that has that engraved or kind of laser etched or carved cut, whatever the hell it is, texture into the bar um, so that you can grip into it. Uh, there are some that don't have knurling in the middle. Um, those aren't really super great for squatting the ones that do it'll grab into your shirt those are really nice um are you guys do you guys super picky about like you know, with a novice who's working on a gym without bumpers or without a dedicated deadlift platform do you guys care about that um if they're on the olympic platform i rather than use the bumpers but i've had people use the standard metal plates on an olympic platform it's fine mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah um yeah so i would definitely say the the racks to bars to bumpers to platforms those are in priority order Mm. if it's just like if it's you know if it's not a great rack if it's a step rack and you're kind of in between two squat settings it's going to be a pain in the ass same thing with overhead press um you know make sure you have a good rack set up first and then go on to bars and then if you have if you've met those criteria figure out your bumpers and figure out your platforms um one thing i want to touch on was quality versus quantity um if you have a, a really nice gym that's like small it's boutique and then there's like two squat racks and there's three really nice barbells, but there's, you know, 30 people who go there during the hours that you go there, it's not worth it. You're probably just not going to be able to use them, you know? Um, but if you go to like an old YMCA that has six squat racks and like 10 barbells floating around, they may be worse, but it may be better to go there so that you can get your stuff done in a timely manner. Um, so consider that. Uh, the next thing I would say is the crowd or population. Uh, this kind of goes in with what Crown of Iron was saying. Um, he was saying considerations, uh, no high school kids clogging up the gym bench press stations. Um, I always have really good workouts uh, when I'm traveling at gyms where no one else is doing barbell stuff. You know, <laughs> it's like Bad I have every, everything to myself. No one's going to bother me. Um, you know, yeah, you're um, like the unique person that walks into the gym. They're like, what is that guy doing? I'm like, weird. Why is he grunting and crying? Um, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, so consider who the crowd and population is like, is it a bunch of 19 year old dudes just banging it out on the dumbbell rack? They're having a good time. That may be a fun atmosphere that you're looking for. Probably not super productive for training, depending on who you are. Um, if you're going to go in and it's all like, Hey, it's, it's ladies night for the local retirement home. And they do that every day from six to 8 PM. Probably not the best place to train either. You know, um, do you guys have any words of wisdom about this one? About the training environment? 
Yeah, like who the crowd and population, like what the gym is marketed for, you know? Yeah, I think this kind of depends on the person going in. Like um, mm. if I was, you know, if I didn't know what starting strength was and I'm 23, I'm walking into a gym, like I want a place to where there's like-minded people like me going in there. Well, mm-hmm. I guess this is true for really anyone. I want people that are like-minded like me. Um, I want someone who I can tell, like I can like pick them up from afar from the gym and I'm going to compete with that dude because I know that I'm very competitive <laughs> so I can compete with him, right? And uh, then maybe I end up bros with them or some shit down the line. But yeah, that's what I love about our gyms in the, the SSC uh, world here is that we have like-minded people, right? It's um, people just off the street and they come in and they get to know each other and then they ended up, you know, like our 530 class, they're always congratulating people and it's always a cheer fest and stuff like that. If you don't find people that are like that in your gym, which it's not going to be every single gym, um, mm-hmm. then you may need to look around and kind of take that into account. Yeah, this segues into number four. You know, it's like, yeah. are you going in? Everyone is wearing their headphones and looking down and not talking to each other. I don't really like training in those places. You know, um, I always tell people like, hey, don't wear headphones in the gym. Make friends with the people next to you. Not only for accountability's sake, but in case you ever need help in the gym, and just to make it a social thing. Like we're, we're social creatures at the end of the day. Um, do people have training partners? Like, is everyone just working out by themselves, just kind of like head down, headphones on, you know, um, or is it kind of a community thing where it's just like, Hey, you're going to set a squat PR and people are going to like, you know, fist bump you and, and tell you to do a good job. First time you hit 500 or something like that. Um, and then is it a gym that has a PR board? I think that's like one of my easiest indicators for if the gym is going to be quality or not. Like if you go in and it's like, House best deadlift is six ten. House best bench is like four fifteen. House best squat is like five thirty. I'm like, great. This is a this is a decent gym where there's some people doing some stuff there. Um, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I I agree with that too. I, I you know, you're gonna be person to person. You know what you're looking for when you walk in. But I mean, even for myself, you know what I noticed. Um, you know, I would lift in between class times or after class times. And if there was somebody that was hanging out over time a little bit, or I was able to jump into actual uh, training times um, before I went in at night, you're, you're seeing the community of the, of the gym. And I think that's the one thing that, um, you know, dare I say it, the SSC or the, the starting strength gyms have taken from maybe the CrossFit um, kind of idea, not idea, but you know, there's a community there. There's a, there's mm-hmm. like-minded people there that they're, they're excited to cheer people on and, and, um, and they, they become friends. I mean, and that's, I think, you know, wearing headphones, we don't want that. We got music on, you know, let's, let's yeah. listen to, to what's going on there. And then one, you know, you're being safe, you're listening to the coach, you're doing what you have to do logistically in the gym. Um, but then you're, like I said, you're creating that environment that you want, um, and you're helping other people create that environment because they're gonna, they're probably looking for that too, that a little bit of that excitement and, and, uh, cheering for each other. So, yeah. yeah. All hugely important. Yeah. And that's definitely one thing that I think the, the franchise gyms do a really good way at. It's just like, even the, even with the layout of it, you know, or it's just like racks are facing the wall when you're done, no one is just going to stand there and stare at the wall. They're going to turn around and their friends mm-hmm. are there, you know? Exactly. Um, uh, G lock said one that I think may actually, I, curse me for not putting this up there he said proportion of people on steroids is also an indicator <laughs> yes yeah i love going into gyms and just seeing some dudes who are just like they're benching 275 for 25 reps they're just just jacked to hell that's the best i think just the old school bodybuilding gyms there are a few of those around where i'm at in virginia beach and it's always just a pleasure like they so the the two that are around here if anyone in virginia they're called iron asylum they have a posing room if it has a posing room oh fuck you know you're in the <laughs> company. Yeah, they're like, we have developed a room that has the best lighting in the whole world. So is it just lighting in like a bunch of mirrors? Like, is it like 365 mirrors everywhere? No, it's just a cage that you get into that's surrounded <laughs> yeah. by mirrors. Um, no, no, but it's uh, there's there's some competing bodybuilders there. Um, you know, yeah. so essentially what it is, it's just like it's it's a pretty good replication of staged lights, you know, um, so that you don't go in there and get washed out. But yeah, that's a uh, it's always good. Um, you can tell if it's going to be a hardcore gym or not. Um, and then you know, I, I had these ones here. We'll run through these pretty quickly. Um, so there's uh, more or less three models of gyms currently. Uh, just to recap, there's going to be a health spa, which is going to be like your Planet Fitness, LA Fitness, generic Globo gym. There's going to be like a new age powerlifting gym, which just could be like a black iron, you know, dungeon um, or a dedicated barbell club. And there's going to be kind of like the CrossFit box ones um, or the ones that are going to be like specific trainer studios where it's like no one's actually working out there unless the trainer who owns it or runs it is there. And it's going to be like a class environment. Um 
uh, if you had to, if you guys had to help someone pick between, let's say, just the first option, if they have to go with a generic gym, which one would you end up going for? Things like that. Definitely a place like a powerlifting gym. Um, no, I'm saying if you oh, if you like don't have one? access to number two, if you're oh, okay. if you have just to like choose number between one? number one, I've seen some uh, some anytime fitnesses or 24 hour fitnesses that have had really nice like rack setups, Alico like bumpers. Um, so I think either one of those I've seen um, as as options as far as uh, the, you know the health spa that has a different you know, the showers and the the saunas and things like that as well. And I think that's kind of where you're going with the, the health mm-hmm. spa aspect of it. Um, but you're going to at least get one or two uh, racks with a decent bar. Like I said, it's at least straight. Maybe use, uh, I think Pete or somebody put up a starting strength um, video about how to make a center neural with a piece of tape, you know. So if you end up at getting to a gym that you like and maybe they just don't have that aspect to the bar bring a piece of tape, you know, bring Mm -hmm. some, you know, you could make that work. But those are the two that I've seen that at least from afar, I know have a decent setup for you to get some, uh, to get some decent equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it is very interesting that sometimes, uh, these gyms who were just so used to spending silly amounts on equipment, they're like, Oh, we have like an $8,000 leg press that, you know, four people use. Mm -hmm. Um, they're so used to tying up all of that capital that when it's like, Hey, you know, this is a $1,200 barbell and like, you know, like a, a $1,400 plate set. They're like, yeah, it's totally fine. Um, so sometimes you will go to those gyms and be like, why the hell do they have the nicest <laughs> barbells in the world? Like no yeah. one is using, like people are curling with like a, a Lico, um, you know, Oli bar. Um, those things will sneak up on you. Um, but yeah. So what I would say for, advice for these ones um and having to had to work out a lot of these make sure they don't have hex plates like la fitness and like planet fitness if they do have plates they will always have like the hex plates that you know it's terrible to deadlift with can't power Mm -hmm. clean with them very well either um if it has the hex plates get out of there immediately um and then make sure that there's like a dedicated area for deadlifting as well. That's another one I'm running to. It's like, it'll have a squat rack, but it won't have any place to deadlift. So you'll just have to deadlift in the floor randomly and the employees may kick you out. Um, you know, so just make sure with those. Um, but I would say like, I would rather someone work out at a CrossFit gym than a health spa for sure. You know, this is like my least preferred option. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've always, mm-hmm. I've always told people like if they're going on vacation somewhere or anything, Hey, I got to go out of town. Do you know any gyms? I always say research the local, uh, CrossFit boxes and just call them and see if you, they have a drop in price. And more often than not, they'll be like, yeah, you know, drop 10, 15, 20 bucks, whatever it is. And, um, you know, they and then just tell them, Hey, I don't even, I don't want to do the wad. I don't need any coaching. <laughs> I just need a spot. <laughs> Please leave me alone. Yes. Yes. Just let me be. I'll give you my money. If you just let me be. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. So powerlifting gyms, they're getting more and more popular. Mm-hmm. Thankfully. Um, you know, uh, there are, I think I should have put almost bodybuilding gyms in here. I would say that, you know, hardcore bodybuilding gyms are more popular than powerlifting gyms still. And um, it's like, they'll have a few squat racks and everything, but they'll just have every machine that has been finally curated by like some, you know, some bodybuilder for the past three years. Um, those are always good options. Um, and I've also been seeing a lot of barbell clubs recently where it's basically just like a warehouse space that some guys and a bunch of his friends are renting. And then they have kind of a key fob system for everybody else there too. Um, you can't really go wrong with these i don't think anything that has the word powerlifting black iron bodybuilding barbell if it has those words in it you'll probably be fine um, have you guys had any negative experiences with these places before um so funny enough like um this was whenever i was in college and i was looking for a place to train because i got kicked out of our um of our athletic place at that school because the coaches were dumbasses so i ended up going to um a crossfit box and i was saying just like how amanda was with one of her clients i was like hey just can i drop in and you know pay a certain amount they're like no you have to do the wad like <laughs> we physically cannot allow anyone who's never done lifting before to you know work it on their own i'm like uh, no i've i'm lifting before like i've studied underneath mark ripito and they're like oh mark ripito he's that one dude who you know xx and x i'm like oh fuck fuck this I'm not doing these crossfit boxes man uh yeah boxes can be weird hit or miss yeah. very hit or miss it's a, it's the personalities that it tie into the box for I sure think. for sure mm-hmm. yeah. um because like the requirements to open up a crossfit affiliate i believe is just someone has to be there who is a level one crossfit coach yeah, it's a thousand dollars is it is, is yeah. that for real that's, that's the, the i think the crossfit level one 
um, sick credentials just a thousand dollars i had no yeah. idea the no, guys we're, we're dropping starting strength and going to crossfit now nah, man, I'm good. <laughs> one weekend and a thousand bucks it's way easier and I get to, I get to be a level one. Um, but yeah, that's the best level actually. Um, but yeah, so CrossFit gyms are weird because of the things that Chase was talking about. Like the hours, if, unless they have like a dedicated area with like a separate rack for free open workouts, you'll have to work out around their class schedule and their class mm-hmm. schedules are going to be like before work, one in the afternoon and then after work. Um, so that's when basically everybody works out. And if you're trying to get into one of those slots, they may have a class then, you know, so you'll mm-hmm. have to go and do the wad of 50 wall, whatever's, um, or, you know, you'll have to find, see if they have an open area to work out in. That's hard to do. If you have the, you know, the liberty to work out at odd hours, CrossFit gyms are great, you know, because it's just entirely empty. There's just kind of dude there cleaning up. Um, and then I would say if there's anything, if you just kind of look up personal trainers or fitness studios or anything like that, there are a lot of trainer specific ones where it's just like that space that they work in. Um, they normally will never let you work out just by yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if it's like Jerry's personal training center and you're not doing personal training with Jerry, he has mm-hmm. no incentive to not let you in. Yeah, literally none. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, you know, just look up powerlifting gym, look up black iron gym, barbell clubs, um, and then you'll find it. Um, I would say how much, this is an interesting question. How much would you guys pay for a gym with no coaching at the gym? So not like the franchise model. Um, but like just to show up, just key, just key card access. Um, Yeah, not for a drop in, but like, what do you think is a fair monthly rate for just like a gym with some barbells and some racks? What do you guys think Mm. is fair? Um, if I'm not getting any other amenities, man, I'm thinking like 65, I was going to say 50 yeah. bucks, somewhere between 50 and maybe if it's a nice enough gym, 75 bucks a month. I mean, if you really break it down to what you're paying for and you're not getting any type of coaching or anything like mm-hmm. that, I think somewhere in that 50 to 75 range is, is doable. Cause then, you know, you're getting something like you said, equipment wise, what you're looking for, those things on the previous mm-hmm. slide, you're, if it checks all those boxes, um, you're going to pay that extra, that extra buck for that specifically. Um, especially if it's not as crazy busy and overrun with all the, the young, you know, gym bros taking up the bench and all that type of stuff. So mm-hmm. I think you're paying maybe that little bit extra for that, but at the same time, I mean, it's, that's your, that's my range I would pay if I was not in the situation I'm in now. Yeah, I, I'd say, I think that may even be, I mean, depending on where you are, of course, you know, um, if you're, if you're in some sort of uh, dystopian city hellhole, it will be more. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think 75 is probably a, a, something I would top out at. That would be like mm-hmm. excellent gear, right, excellent 100%. machines yep. for 75. I think yep. like normally if it's just like a YMCA style, I th- also YMCA is a really reliable. I'm not knocking them at all, by the way, they'll almost always have the stuff that you need there. Um, but if it's like a YMCA or around that tier, I would say, you know, like 50 a month is pretty normal, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, People who work at gyms will be able to tell if you've never been into a gym before and you don't know what you're doing. So they may try to upsell you on memberships, try to upsell you on like personal training stuff. You know, um, it, it's it, it's not terribly dissimilar to like getting a cell phone plan or getting a car or anything like that. Just mm-hmm. go in, get a short contract. With and I would definitely, want. exactly. I would also say work out there, do like a week's worth of day passes. So if you do three or four workouts a week, do four day passes, work out there a few times, you know? Um, Cause like you may go in on a not crowded day and be like, Hey, this is great. And then you go back on like Monday and the entire thing is, is jam packed. It's That's too crowded. Good, for good. Yeah. Um, so I would definitely say, make sure that you get a, a big sample, go on a weekend day, go on an afternoon, go in an evening. Um, any other advice for picking a gym guys? Um, no, I think we kind of covered it. Um, and just look at the people around you too. Like if you see a bunch of like sketchy people in the gym, um, I definitely wouldn't stay there. Like if you're in like an all bro society gym like, and then you see like a bunch of like random, like 45 to 55 year old guys walk in it, just at, you know, 6 PM on Monday night. And they're only there at that time. It's like, I probably wouldn't go in at Monday during that time. Cause I don't want those creepy old men to like, spank something <laughs> off in the in the bathroom as i'm trying to lift you know i did not expect that answer <laughs> i did not i did not think that's where you were going but valid advice maybe if yeah. that maybe that only happens to people as pretty as chase that's never happened to me before <laughs> that's a good point yeah and so that's a chase specific thing he's like yeah people yeah. just keep coming and you know try to have babies I'm haunted with me. By it. i know um but yeah so this is jtd's squat it seems like we have 245 on the bar i think We'll see how these go. Yeah, 
How do you guys feel about this depth? Uh, my internet's slow as fuck, so I'll tell you in a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the first one, the first one seemed all right. Amanda, I so part been, of I think Chase's sorry, part of Chase's rustic charm is that he has terrible internet. Um, so you know, we'll be we'll we you and I will attempt to watch the videos at normal human <laughs> speed. <laughs> oh, um, we got a little high. How many is he doing here? I don't even. I thought he'd done. Um, I I loop the video, so it's not a set of ten. Don't worry, it's a set of five. <laughs> I gotcha. I looked <laughs> yeah. over. I looked over at Chase because he was skipping. I see what you mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would like for these to be a little bit deeper. Um, I think that you're jamming your face down to initiate the rep. I would recommend trying to keep your face a little bit higher up off the ground. Um, you're leaning over plenty, so I don't. I don't think you need to think about doing it anymore. What do you think, Amanda? No, I agree. I, I think some of the reps he kind of, like you said about his face, uh, try to bend your knees a little sooner from the top, so that everything's kind of. Uh, bending at the same time, you know, hips are going back, chest down, bend the knees. Cause he's like you said, he's, he's trying to, I think just shove his head down, shove his face down instead of actually, you know, getting everything going over the middle of the foot. Yeah. So this, this is the, this is a still from rip four. I think it's rip five, but this is a little bit high as well. I would say, um, you know, think about just sitting straight into your heels, you know, like you can cue a different, almost more of a high bar squat in the situation. Cause you've already leaned over a ton. You're mm -hmm. sending your butt back. We know you're doing that. Um, you know, so it would probably be helpful to, to be a little more vertical and the knees definitely first, like I made a point of that. It was, I, I didn't notice that at first you're leaning over at the hips to start. You know, you want hips and knees simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that'll fix a lot of it, and especially if he, the mm -hmm. once he's the one or so that he's cutting off, um, you know, he he's probably just feeling a little bit far forward because he's he's so far bent over right at the beginning. That's how I used to squat. I used to squat like that when I was like, oh, I got to do the starting strength low bar squat. It was terrible. <laughs> I got to bend over as much as I can. It's, uh, it's like, why are my erectors sore all the time? <laughs> it's terrible. Um, we got Mike's deadlift here coming into three plates. We'll see how this goes. Chase, are you back in the land of the uh, the bandwidth yeah, now? Like how are I'm, you doing? It's it's still pretty slow. Mike is kind of moving in <laughs> slow motion, but uh, we're getting there. Yeah, it's cheating for you because you can see everything in slow motion. We all have to we have to watch this. <laughs> no, I hate it. Frame hate by it. frame action over there. Yeah. Actually, I had an online client who did that with his presses because we're working on the timing. I'm like, dude, this is fucking me up. Like, I need to see it a little bit faster. So please never do that again. <laughs> Be like, yeah, I he's need you to help you, coach. He's like, I need yeah. you to throw your hips at frame 53. You know, exactly. that way when he's doing it, he'll know exactly <laughs> when that is. Yeah. All right. I think this this frame is a little bit. We're gonna do this like this one. Hopefully, that's better. Yeah, he's looking like, to me. He's oh, going look, around nice these. And... He's fast forwarded now. Yeah, we're we're we've reset the video on this one, Chase. If you're if you're still behind, gotcha. Um, I like to see his toes out a little bit more. I think he's kind of getting jammed up in the that start position with his, his stomach. Turn your toes out, make some room there, and I think you'll be a little bit easier getting your back set there and get your hips up a little bit higher too. Yeah, he's definitely um, think, on his heels. Yeah, I think he's kind of sinking down into it, trying to get set. Um, I just think that's not possible with his thighs getting in the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Around the knees, a little bit higher hips. Um, I don't know if I would put the toes out more. I would probably bring the heels in. I don't know if pushing the toes out will accomplish the, the knee position. Why so? So I think if you bring in the heels a little bit, um, he may just get bunched up again. Unless if he's already here at this stance, because I mean, he is kind of wide in the hips. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather just keep his stance out a little bit wider. The problem mm -hmm. with it, I mean, I can't really see with his grip though. I mean, it doesn't look too wide. Yeah. But if if we, I mean, yeah, if we were to go a little bit wider with his heels, he definitely would run into an issue there. But I think yeah, you're seeing his, his arms out. already kind of having mm -hmm. trouble uh, with the arm. You know, with changing his stance, I think you're gonna you're gonna have an effect on the arm mm -hmm. position. Like he's he's already a little bent, so yeah, I don't think you want to widen that up too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just keep the heels there and just widen up the toes, but that's my take. And then is that was that rep four? Is this rep this is this is now rep five. Let's see how this one goes. 
Yeah, the arms are definitely a little bit bent off the floor. They straighten out, of course, as the bar mm-hmm. leaves the floor, so it's not too big of a deal. Um, do yeah, but those are pretty solid. Still looked fairly easy. IMO. Um, what do you guys want? Do you guys want a deadlift or a bench next or a squat? What do we think? Whatever you are close to clicking on. Terrible. All right, bench it is. <laughs> All right, this is Aaron doing some volume work at 315. I want to say this is a set of four or five, I forget, but we shall see. I think his setup is prohibitively long. I'm going to fast forward this. Oh, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> wow. All right, wait. Here we go. I think he's kind of jerky with the bar going down. Um, you got to make the transition kind of a little bit smoother, Aaron. So think about pulling it into the chest, not just letting it drop on you, right? And that's going to help solidify the touch point as well. So if you pull it into you and kind of screech it to a halt right above your shirt, just kind of barely scraping your shirt, um, that's what I'm kind of looking for there. Yeah, because it kind of looks like he's, it's almost like he's going just a touch horizontal before kind of bending mm. the elbows right away from the top. Um, so I, I would like to see him kind of think about the elbows first from the top rather than traveling any any distance horizontally and then coming down because that's going to kind of get your, you're going to have an inconsistent touch point at that point at, to that extent. And then he slips a little bit. It looked like kind of in the later part of the set, maybe on reps three or four, he slips with his feet. Mm-hmm. I yeah, I think that's that's just just carpet. Just the, yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if that's an effect of the like flooring carpet. or what. Yep, there you go. Yeah. So I don't know if it's – it might be a good idea to to get like a mat or something for underneath your feet so you have a little bit better grip rather than slipping with the shoes. Just rip the carpet up, man. Nah, that too. Okay. Just cut holes where your feet go. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think these are, I, I would, I would recommend on top of everything that Chase and Amanda have said so far, uh, thinking more backwards off the chest. I think on the first rep, it's the most noticeable. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't go backwards right off the chest. It comes a little bit up and out, a little bit up and out before moving backwards. And then he mm-hmm. catches it as the elbows come out to get it back over the shoulder. Um, yeah, I like what, I like what Chase was saying about pulling the bar down to start the rep. Cause it is a little bit of like this jerky free fall almost on the pacing. For sure. Any other parting shots for Aaron, everybody? No, I mean, just make sure you cut those holes to spec and uh, <laughs> save the carpet so you can always put it back. Yeah. Yeah. Landlord. Little <laughs> slots for your feet. Exactly. Um, all right. Let's see. Let's see a deadlift. We haven't seen a deadlift from this guy in a while. Um, this is Hardy. Do you remember Hardy, Chase? Yeah, I think so. He's Cavs guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he has like mm-hmm. the boat. Yeah, yeah. So he has like the boat. Yeah. And all the cool shit around his, uh, his walls there. Mm-hmm. He has quite the setup going on. Do you guys ever lift in hats? I do. I've did it. I've done it one time, and I don't know. I'm not really big on hats. Never again. I, <laughs> yeah, I didn't really care for it. Yeah, I'm at that. My, my hair is not long enough to get up in a ponytail yet, so I'd say uh, I got to keep it back somehow out of my face. Okay. What has been his MO? Because I think he's kind of rushing his setup. And not really extending his back completely. I don't think we've seen a deadlift from him maybe even ever. We've seen a ton of squats and yeah, overhead press. I want to think guy. so. I'm pretty sure we have. Just been have a we? while, though. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, these are coming off the shin almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dog. Um, they're not really even behind midfoot. You're just kind of knocking them there. Um, I would just try and pick your butt up and behind you. The the Q set that I really like for this, I'll switch it so it's like this, so you can see me a little bit better. Um, magic. Okay. So, you know, if we have our shoulders here and our hips here, I don't want to think just shoulders up, and I don't want to think just hips up. I want them both to go up and together. Okay. So it's not just one piece or the other piece. So when I'm telling you to pick your hips up, I'm not telling you to pull your shoulders down. Both of them are trying to reach to the ceiling at the same time. Your knees are going to get a little bit more open or extended. Um, and you should, 
ideally you should be feeling like you have some tension and some work going through your hamstrings before these things start. Um, you know, it shouldn't feel like a soft setup at all or really comfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love I that cue. I love that cue. I've been getting, um, into the habit, uh, more so, you know, pretty recently about saying like lift the chest, lift the butt at the same time. Um, and, and, and that's kind of seemed to get them mm-hmm. in the habit of understanding where they need to keep their hips because like you said, they get in, they get in, in their head that if you're just lifting the chest that the butt's got to go down or if they lift the hips, then, you know, they dip forward or something like that. So if they lift those two things at the same time, it's a great cue. Mm-hmm. I honestly, I just pull that at the, at the tail end of the teaching progression. You know, I'll go through the standard five set. We'll do like the first set running through the singles and then their first like task basically for their working set or whatever the next warm up set is, is making sure that happens on both of them. It's like, you know, trying to bring your entire torso as high up off the ground as you can. I like that. Um, mm-hmm. I think the other thing that I may petition for, I don't know who to, who to petition this for. I've been really liking teaching the deadlift before the squat in its entirety. Why? Wow. Um, so the, the squat doesn't, I, I don't think the squat confers any advantage to the deadlift having teaching it first. I think the deadlift confers advantage mm-hmm. to teaching the squat because you already have back extension down. You know, so when I can tell people, Hey, lean over just like you did in the deadlift, keep your back tight. just like you did in the deadlift, that's already a thing that is now more automated and easier to accomplish. Um, having taught that initially, whereas with the squat, there's nothing in the deadlift that I reference back, you know? No, I mean, that is a valid point, but you also, you also have to consider like the fatigue cost, right? I mean, I granted, yes, it's only a set of five, but it's way heavier than what you're going to be doing on the squat. First session, I uh, yeah, I still so. okay. Have you had anybody that's had like a ch- perfectly fine look, look pretty decent during the squat teaching progression, and then all of a sudden they could not set their back when they were when you were teaching them the deadlift? I've had people who are shitty at having back extension on the squat who are still shitty doing it in the deadlift. <laughs> Okay. But it's okay. it's like a fight to get it. It's like you can eventually get it in the deadlift because that's almost like the entire focus of the deadlift is, is mm-hmm. you know, is getting that down. Um, so it's like, hey, you know, with 20 minutes of direct tutoring on, you know, getting into back extension on the deadlift, you'll have it. But when I'm done, I'm like, man, I wish we would have had that tool earlier in the squat, um, you know, but it's definitely I think with people who are like already working and heavy stuff, like like at the seminar, for example, if some guy's like, I'm going to impress the seminar staff and I'm going to pull the heaviest five RM I've ever pulled. I wouldn't want them to do that first, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but within the context of a normal session, I, I, I've been noticing I've been doing deadlift earlier and earlier. Uh, parting shots for Hardy guys. Yeah. Just utilize the legs more so than your back. That's essentially what, both of y'all, your cues kind of just down, distilled down to is you not picking it up with your back. You're just pushing with your legs. Amanda, anything for our boy here? Yeah, no, I think that's covered it. All right. Let's see what else we got. Hmm. All right. We got another squat coming up. This is a low angled squat, not the squat itself, nice. the camera. How about that? We'll say that correctly this time. Oh, those are always fun. Mm hmm. So speaking of gyms, what would you classify this gym, Alex and Amanda? This kind of looks like a Amanda. You go like first. I actually know oh, what gym man. it is. You know what the gym is? Yeah. I mean, I would. I, it depends, kind of, because when you said health spa, I mean, it just kind of depends on. Oops. It just kind of depends on what they have to offer. Um, you know, I think I would go more in the first, uh, put it in the first column than I would in a powerlifting gym. Mm-hmm. This is a YMCA. Mm, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that uh, I, I know this, uh, this lifter, he submits some form checks uh, through the app. Um, but if, if, if anything ever looks incredibly old, almost always YMCA. A YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was about to say, yeah, he has York plates or and all a that high shit. school. Uh-huh. Yeah, if it's ever like super, super old, it's like, yeah, there's just some high school kids taking care of it on the weekends. It's not it's not <laughs> the most maintained thing in the world. How are you feeling about the squat? Well, he is really getting getting down there. <laughs> getting a little loose. <laughs> uh. 
yeah from i mean from that perspective uh, he's he's like kind of slamming down into the bottom um you know lifting his head he's kind of got a couple things that would just if he would take the extra second to get a little bit tighter and keep his chin tucked um yeah, he's, I think he's just kind of thinking in his head, oh, shit, I don't know if I'm going to stem back up. So he's trying to get down to the bottom and use a, that excessive bounce. Is there such a thing, excessive bounce? Well, oh, yeah. I think in their head, I think they're thinking, how do I get more bounce? Not necessarily that there is a such thing, but I think he's like, oh, I really got to get a bounce on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in reality, that's not what it uh, ends up being. It ends up being them getting loose and out of position and knees forward and that's a wonderful distinction. You know, like the, the, I always tell my lifters like intent versus reality, you know, it's like you may be intending to get more bounce, but you're actually just getting loose, you know? Right. Exactly. And, yeah. I think they perceive it as like, man, I really gotta, I really gotta get to the bottom and, and drive up hard. Um, when in reality they just have to kind of almost take an extra second to get really tight and stay controlled. And, and I really like the idea of thinking, you know, telling them, you know, think about that up think about the the up going out of the yeah bottom. going up the entire time almost yeah yeah, yeah. it yeah. slows them down keeps them tighter mm -hmm. yeah this third rep is quite the grind dog mm -hmm. chase any thoughts i'd like to see james you distinguish from driving your ass back instead of straight up so you're shooting back and that's again a kind of a byproduct of you slamming into the bottom but i think you can salvage these a little bit better by making your ass come straight up rather than back I've had a, uh, I've had some, some success with, uh, personally and with clients telling them to push through their arches. Um, mm -hmm. when they, when they tend to get back out of the hole instead of going straight up, um, mm -hmm. just to kind of give them a, you know, everybody knows where their arches of their feet are is give them kind of a visual point of that's where the force is going through, uh, to keep them a little bit more balanced. Yeah. A specific location. That's always good. Yeah. I think these were just, this may have been the loading call here may just be too aggressive. These are just grindy. These mm. are just they're really, really heavy. I, I don't know, even if the knees, like if, let's say if the knees stayed in an ideal position and the hips are up, I don't know how much faster they would have been. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, for, for sure. I think these are in the, like the long-term changes department, you know, like mm -hmm. expect, try to get these changes to mature over time. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, we got, we'll get we'll get one more deadlift in and we'll call it a night. Let's see. I wonder how long it's set up. I think he has to go through straps too. All right, still strapping, still strapping. There's drop one. Soft lockout for sure. Mm-hmm. Dude, even more soft. <laughs> The softest lockouts, and he's still slowing the bar down on the descent, too. This is an interesting one. Yeah, there's kind of a lot to unpack here. Um, mm -hmm. For one, you got to learn how to set your back right off the floor and hold that extension through the whole entire lift. Two, at the top, nothing happens with your shoulders or your traps. Your chest just shows off and it rotates out like you're trying to pop an alien out of your chest. And your hips extend and your knees extend. So essentially, you stand up to where you can hang on to 365 here all day long. And if you can't, yeah. then you're not locked out all the way. This is basically his finishing position. Yeah. yeah. I would think, you know, just pull the bar like two inches higher. <clears throat> just keep <throat> pulling the bar. And then no need to uh, slow the descent down. I think a faster descent would do you a lot of favors here. Um, yeah, as well he's as almost him. placing it down like forward of the midfoot, kind of where he's coming down. He's like just... He's already out over the. Yeah, it's an interesting tempo RDL that he's doing here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think turning away from the mirror. I think the mirror may be screwing you up a lot here because you're just kind of keeping that head railed by looking at yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you guys find that typically with with newer lifters? You guys see a lot more newer lifters than I do. Um, is that a pretty frequent thing where people will be hesitant to sit or stay at lockout? Um. If they're unbalanced, yes, but that's an easy fix. That's you getting over the midfoot. But I, I haven't really seen too many people 
Well, I take that back. The most common thing I see is people wanting to roll it up with their arms. They think that the deadlift must continue after they locked out their. It's a top. And they kind of like a shrug. Yeah, they kind of like yeah. they kind of like row it yep. up. Like I have a lady that she this will be her third session tomorrow, and she does that. She just like slowly creeps up, and I go behind her and like I grab her elbows and I straighten them. I'm like, no, <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. I the definitely the older population. It's like yeah. that's how kind of how they they've just been so used to trying to do everything with their arms and yeah, um, yeah. But I I mean I think if you, you know if you can get them to slow it down and show them what that lockout position is supposed to be, give them some time to you know like Chase was talking about getting his chest out. You know, give him some time to you know put your hand in front, give him somewhere to somewhere to think about. They get an understanding of what that finished position is supposed to be, so then they don't they don't rush it. Yeah, I'm not sure if people do it as a strategy to get the set done faster. They'll be like, hey, if I hold this bar for an extra, you know, five seconds across the set, I'll just be more gassed. Um, so I've noticed when people start peeking into heavier weights, this will happen. Um, but yeah, not not terribly much with novices. It's definitely something that's, that's good to get ironed out early. Um, but yeah, parting shots for Ryan, higher hips, turn away from the mirror. Um, I think back extension, I think he's, a bit he's keeping it in intent. The intent is there, I think. Um, what do you think, Amanda? Now that we have three votes, three votes of what? Well, so whatever Chase and I disagree, it's just hey, who knows? Yeah, stop up to the gods at that point. Mm -hmm. Now we yeah, have a I third mean, vote. I mean, I would like to, I would like to see him get his back set a little bit tighter, and you know, even if it takes that extra, that extra second at the bottom, you know, um, and and let it come down, you know, if if he can allow it to be more of a controlled drop, I think he'd he'd have more, more energy to, to set his back. I wonder you know, if this is, is a trying to be quiet in the gym thing. Sometimes know, it's noisy, man. There's a bunch of old fucks <laughs> behind him. So yeah, yeah there's, him. yeah, there's some old guy doing his 135 quarter squatting in the back. Um, but yeah. Okay. All right. We, we ran over. This is, I think the last two also have been doing that as well um yeah we're at an hour 11 um but yeah thank you very much for watching everybody um amanda where can people find you at instagram social media stuff like that uh yeah i have an instagram uh i believe my i remember my name more often uh amanda.shep s-h-e-p-p -P underscore s-s-c um is my instagram handle um i'm not on twitter um so what are you posting on your instagram what's going on there uh usually i i've kind of kind of fallen off because I'm not in the gym right now. Um, yeah. But I would do like on my story, I would do clients, um, you know, big numbers and PRs and stuff like that. Um, you know, personally, I've done some posts on like some of my rehab stuff and milestones that I've gotten back to, um, you know, so I got to get back into doing that. But more so it was, you know, I'll, I'll get in the habit of, uh, you know, sharing the stories of all the gyms and, and uh, you know, the personal clients and, and all that stuff. So um, hopefully here is, as I get myself back into a starting strength gym, I will, uh, uh, you know, I'll get back into the habit of that. Okay. Exciting stuff from Chase mm -hmm. and uh, Amanda's Instagram. I do not have an Instagram. I don't disparage people who do have Instagrams. Don't get me wrong. But I think I would just be I didn't hear it in your tone at all. Or I know. <laughs> <laughs> I would just be terrible at it. And I, I feel like I spend... I'll spend maybe 10 to 15 minutes a day on Facebook and I feel like it's too much. I feel demoralized for like an hour afterwards. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I feel like if I was on Instagram, it would be like 10 times worse. Um, but yeah, so we have our contact information below. We'll put Amanda's Instagram on there. Chase's Instagram. Anything else you guys want to talk about? Um, that's it. That's it. All right. Thank you very much for watching everybody. Um, and if you have anything you want us to talk about uh, next week, uh, let us know in the comments. All right. See you guys.